So I, I rode my bicycle for a year in 2010 uh, from uh, Canada to Colombia, and as part of that journey, I discovered that basically a billion people in the world didn't have uh, access to clean drinking water. So I began this journey and did some higher level education and been on a series of trips with my friends in the last six years. That's all led us to this, to this spot now where we've become very interested in um, small scale uh, decentralized desalinization projects. It's really the future of water. Welcome, I'm stoked everyone that you could be with us for today's Beach Talk. I want to help us understand every word of God that's in the word of God. God has so many amazing things that he wants to teach us and say to us every day. So thank you for taking the time to be with us for today. Now, my objective is always simple. It's disciples making disciples who plant churches that plant churches. Now, we want to see Jesus be a grassroots, go anywhere movement that works in us and through us uh, in our lives. Now, Matthew 11 says, now it came to pass when Jesus finished commanding his 12 disciples that he departed from there to teach and to preach in their cities. And when John had heard in prison about the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples and said to him, are you the coming one or do we look for another? Now, when Jesus finished commanding his 12 disciples, according to F.A. Bruce, to preach in their cities does not refer to the cities of the disciples, but the cities of Galilee. In this way, Jesus gave his commissioned disciples room to do their work. Now, he sent two of his disciples. It is also possible, but perhaps less likely, that John did not ask this question for his own sake, but for the sake of his disciples. Now, he wanted them to go to Jesus and to ask the question for themselves so they would have the responsibility, causing them to focus their attention on Jesus. Now, William Barclay points out that Herod Antipas of Galilee had paid a visit to his brother during Rome. Now, during that time, he had seduced his brother's wife. He came home again, and he dismissed his own wife and married his sister-in-law, whom he had lured away from her husband. Now, publicly and sternly, John rebuked Herod. It was never safe to rebuke an Eastern despot. And Herod took his revenge. John was thrown into the dungeons of the fortress uh, in the mountains near the Dead Sea. Now, when they said, are you the coming one or do we look for another? John, um, and in, in another passage indicated before this, that he clearly recognized Jesus as the Messiah. His present doubt may be explained because perhaps he himself misunderstood the ministry of the Messiah. Perhaps he thought that if Jesus were really the Messiah, he would perform works connected with the political deliverance of Israel, or at least the deliverance of John, who was in prison. Now, it is possible that John made a mistaken distinction between the coming one and the Christ, the Messiah. There is some indication that some Jews of that time distinguished between a prophet to come, promised by Moses in Deuteronomy 18, and the Messiah. The domino, dominant note here is one of confusion. John's, John's long trial in prison had confused them. Now, verse 4, Jesus answered and said to them, Go and tell John the things which you hear and see, the blind see and the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. And blessed is he who is not offended because of me. Now, go and tell John the things that you hear and see. Jesus wanted to assure both John and his disciples that he was the Messiah, but he also reminded them that this power would be displayed mostly in humble acts of service, meeting individual needs, and not in spectacular displays of political deliverance. Now, we might phrase John's question like this, Jesus, why aren't you doing more? Now, he utters the same warning for the most part, the way of the Lord's service is the way of plotting perseverance in the doing of apparently small things. Now, the history of the church shows that this is one of the lessons that's the most difficult to learn. Now, blessed is he who's not offended because of me. Jesus knew that the focus of his ministry was offensive to the expectation of Jewish people who longed for political deliverance from Roman domination. But their 
was a blessing for those who were not offended because of the Messiah who came against the expectation of the people. Now, verse 7, as they departed, Jesus began to say to the multitudes concerning John, what did you go into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind. But what did you go out to see? A man clothed in soft garments. Indeed, those who wear soft clothing are in king's houses. But what did you go out to see? A prophet, yes, I say to you, and more than a prophet. For this is he of whom it is written, behold, I will send my messenger before your face who will prepare your way before you. Now, assuredly, I say to you, among those born of women, there has not risen one greater than John the Baptist. But he who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he, and from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence, and the violent take it by force. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John, and if you're willing to receive it, he is Elijah who is to come, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. Now, a prophet, and more than a prophet, Jesus reminded them that John was God's chosen herald of Messiah, not a man pleaser or a self pleaser. He was in fact more than a prophet because he alone had the ministry of serving as the Messiah's herald. For that, he was the greatest of the prophets and the greatest of men among those born of women. There is not risen one greater than John the Baptist. Now, this is he of whom it is written. Now, John was steady, not easily shaken like a reed. John was sober in that he lived a disciplined life, not in love with the luxuries and the comforts of this world. Now, John was a servant, a prophet of God. John was sent as the special messenger of the Lord. Now, John was special in that he could be considered the greatest under the old covenant. John was second to even the least in the kingdom under the new covenant. Now, he who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. Now, though John was great, he was not born again under the new covenant. This is because he lived and died before the completion of Jesus' work at the cross and the empty tomb. Therefore, he did not enjoy the benefits of the new covenant, 1 Corinthians 11 and 2 Corinthians 3 and Hebrews 8. Now, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence, and the violent take it by force. Jesus' reference to violence refers to both the intensity of spiritual warfare surrounding the ministry of Jesus and his herald, and also to be intensely required to persevere in following the kingdom of God. The exact, sense, the exact sense that this has been debated has made it more difficult and complicated by grammar. D.A. Carson gives us the best sense of both expressions. He says, the kingdom has come with holy power and magnificent energy that has been pushing back the frontiers of darkness. This is manifested in Jesus' miracles and his response to John the Baptist. The kingdom is making great strides. Now is the time for courageous people forceful people to take hold of it. Now, for all the prophets in the law prophesied until John, Jesus saw an era ending with John. All the prophets in the law anticipated John and his ministry as a herald. There is a sense in which John spoke for every prophet who heralded Jesus' coming. Now, under the old covenant, every other prophet announced the Messiah is coming. John alone had the privilege of saying the Messiah is here right now. And if you're willing to receive him, he is Elijah who is to come. John also may be seen as Elijah in a partial fulfillment of Malachi 4. Now, John was not actually Elijah, but he served in the same spirit and the same power of Elijah. This fulfilling his, his office of what he was meant to do. Elijah was this symbolic added if you're willing to receive it. Now, Elijah did come, in fact, during Jesus' ministry, during the transfiguration in Matthew 17, but in further fulfillment of Malachi, Elijah will come again before the second coming of Jesus, likely as one of the two prophets, according to Revelation 11. Now, if John the Baptist's ministry was like that of Elijah, we remember that Elijah became depressed and discouraged. He says, him who has ear, ears to hear, let him hear. This was a proverbial form of speech that was used by Jesus to utter important utterances and it's mentioned here for the first time in Matthew. 
Now in verse 16, but to what shall I liken this generation? It is like children sitting in the marketplaces and calling to their companions and saying, we played the flute for you and you did not dance. We mourned to you and you did not lament. For John came neither eating nor drinking and they're saying he has a demon. Now the son of man came eating and drinking and they say, look, a glutton and a wine bibber, a friend of a tax collector and a sinner, but wisdom is justified by her children. But to what shall I say, like in this generation? Jesus here considered the nature of his current generation and how they were choosy and uncertain in receiving God's message and his messengers. Now we played the flute for you and you did not dance. We mourned to you and you did not lament. The idea is that those who have a heart to criticize will always find something to criticize. Many people wouldn't be pleased with either John or Jesus. Now, a friend of tax collectors and sinners, Jesus quoted the criticisms of others against him, though these words were meant to condemn, they have become wonderful. Jesus really is a friend of sinners. At first, it was a malicious nickname, and now it was a name of honor. F.A. Bruce. He says, but wisdom is justified by her children. However, the wise man is proved to be wise by his wise actions. Jesus had especially in mind the wisdom to accept both Jesus and John for what they were called to be. Now, people might criticize John, but look at what he did. He led thousands of people into repentance, preparing the way for the Messiah. People might criticize Jesus, but look at what he did. He taught and worked and loved and died like no one ever has. Criticism is part of the territory. Now in verse 20, then he began to rebuke the cities which most of his works had been gone because they had failed to repent. He said, woe to you, to this city, Chorazon, Bethsaida, for if the mighty works that had been done to you were done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I say to you, it will be more tolerable for those cities in the day of judgment than for you and you, Capernaum, you were exalted to heaven, will be brought down to Hades. For if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Sodom, it would have been it would have remained until this day. But I say to you that it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom uh, in the day of judgment than for you. Now Jesus began to rebuke the cities in which most of his mighty works had been done because they did not repent. Because most of his mighty works were done in these cities, they experienced a greater light, which also required a greater accountability. Nowadays, people want influence, but they don't want the responsibility. Responsibility means that, the, means that we have tremendous accountability before God. We have forgotten this in a way that, many, that maybe no other generation has. It'll be more tolerable. When Jesus said that it will be more tolerable for certain cities in the day of judgment, he implied that there are in fact different degrees of judgment. Some will be punished more severely in the final judgment than others. Now Corazon, Bethsaida, Capernaum, God's judgment was fulfilled against these cities. Each one of them was destroyed long ago, has been desolate for generations. So we don't read in the Gospels of the great works Jesus did in these cities, but we're told something about them in John 21, and there are also many other things that Jesus did, which if they were written one by one, they would, fill, they would have filled up all the books of the world. John make, makes mention of this at the end of his Gospel. Now, what Jesus did in Chorazon and Bethsaida are among those unwritten works. This is a good reminder that the Gospels are a true account of Jesus' life but he did much more that was not included in the Gospels. Now, verse 25, But at that time Jesus answered and said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and prudent and have revealed them to babies. Even so, Father, it seemed good in your sight. All things have been de delivered to you by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, nor does anyone know the Father except the Son, and the one to whom the, Father, the, the Son reveals to reveal him. 
Now I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth. We sense a strong note of joy in Jesus' communication with his Father. The persons of the Trinity speak and commune with each other with joy. Now, the use of the word answered is suggestive, revealing the perpetual fact of communion existing between Christ and God. A note of praise was the response of Christ's heart to the secret of Jehovah. <laughs> now, you have hidden these things from the wise and the prudent and have revealed to them, to babes, Jesus was happy that God had chosen the unlikely seen by the word as babes to respond to his message of the kingdom. This should be seen in the larger context of the rising rejection of Jesus and his messengers starting in Matthew 9. Now, it also reminds us that if we do respond to Jesus, it is because the Father has revealed these things to babes like us. Now, nor does anyone know the Father except the Son, and the one to whom the, so the Son reveals, or, or wills to reveal him. Since Jesus referred to himself as the Son, we may have another staggering self-focused statement from Jesus. Here he proclaimed that not only did he have a true relationship with God the Father, and that the Father could only be known through the Son, to whom the Son wills to reveal him, these are astonishing self-claims. There are no secrets between the Father and the Son. There is no one who knows the Son as well as the Father does. There is no one who knows the Father as well as the Son does. And the Son chooses to reveal the Father only to some people. Now, there is an important difference in the way that the Son knows the Father and the way we know Him. Now, we know God the Father because He stoops low to us to make Himself known. God the Son knows God because they are equal in nature, completely compatible with one another. Now verse 28, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Jesus says, come unto me. Jesus showed his authority when he says, come unto me. This invitation is unthinkable in the mouth of anyone else but God. And woe to the men who call people to themselves instead of to Jesus. Charles Spurgeon said, come. He drives no one away, calls everyone to himself. His favorite word is come. To Jesus we must come. It's a personal trust, not a doctrine or an ordinance but first to the person of Jesus. Now all who labor and are heavy laden, Jesus directed his call to those who were burdened. He called those who sensed they must come to him to relieve their need instead of living in self-sufficiency. Now according to D.A. Carson, labor implies the burdens we must take upon ourselves and our heavy laden implies the burdens others put upon us. Now, heavy laden suggests the same thought as Matthew 23, where Jesus spoke against the religious leaders of his day as those who bind heavy burdens hard to bear and lay them on men's shoulders. Now, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. Jesus made a wonderful offer, inviting us to take his yoke upon us and to learn from him. We must come as disciples to learn, to be willing to be guided by him, not merely to receive something. Now, According to Adam Clark, the ancient Jews commonly used the ideas of yoke to express someone's obligation to God. There was the yoke of the kingdom, the yoke of the law, the yoke of the command, the yoke of repentance, the yoke of faith, and the general yoke of God. In this context, it's easy to see Jesus simplifying and saying, forget all about these other yokes, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. Now, when someone looks at the yoke of Jesus from a distance, it's easy to get all kinds of wrong ideas about it. But if we would just listen to what Jesus said, take my yoke upon you, we would take it and see what kind of yoke it is. It's actually a beautiful thing to be guided by God. Now, the yoke of Jesus is easy and light compared to the yoke of others. The yoke of Jesus is easy and light as long as we do not rebel against it. The yoke of Jesus has nothing to do with worries that are forbidden to us. The yoke of Jesus does not include the burdens that we choose to add to it. 
for I am gentle and lowly in heart. Jesus revealed his nature when he described himself as gentle and lowly of heart. It is his servant's heart displayed throughout his ministry, making him qualified to be the one who bears our burdens. And you will find Jesus described his gift to his followers as rest for their soul. This unmatchable gift, both powerful and profound, should be considered the birthright of those who come to Jesus and are his followers. They should believe that something is wrong if they don't experience rest for what's happening on the inside. Now my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Jesus summarized this wonderful call with this assurance, the yoke is easy and the burden is light because he bears it with us. Born alone, it might be unbearable, but with Jesus, it can be easy and light. When treating a new animal, such as an ox, to plow, ancient farmers often yoked it to an older, stronger, more experienced animal who bore the burden and guided the young animal through the learning process. That's why we need older mentors or people we look up to. If the yoke is hard and heavy, then we aren't capable of carrying it ourselves. Jesus said it plainly, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. He will help us. Now, this wraps up our time together looking in Matthew today. Maybe you've never prayed before. I always like to end my times in prayer. Prayer is just talking to God. Maybe you need to say sorry for some things you've done. Maybe you need God's guidance. Maybe you need to quit doing some things you've been doing in your life. Maybe you just need a fresh start. We can always pray to God and ask for his help. Let's go ahead and pray together. Just say, God, would you help me? Would you give me a fresh start? Would you help me to align my life with everything that you want me to do? Would you help me do it? In Jesus' name, as always, have a great day. Thank you for your time. We would love to partner with you. Uh, water is a global problem. It's going to take as many partners as we can to help solve this problem. We'd love for you to partner with us. If you can go to our website at www.oceanwater.com. That's O-C-N-W-T-R.com. We'd love that. Thanks so much.